Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to do a review of the Detroit Bikes E-Sparrow. Detroit Bikes sent me this E-Sparrow about a month ago and I've been having a lot of fun just riding it around, collecting my thoughts and figuring out what I like, what I don't like. So with that, first I'm going to go over all the technical specifications of the bike, then if the bike is any good or not, and finally, should you actually get it. So starting off with the frame, this is a hydro-formed aluminum frame uh, welded up in Taiwan. And it is an e-bike specific frame. It has a couple special features such as this port here and down here to conceal the wiring going across the bike, as well it has some extra mounts for the battery tray. This frame comes equipped with horizontal rear dropouts as it's a single speed. But other than that, I don't see a lot of things that are specific to it being an e-bike. One thing to note though, unlike the non-electric Sparrow, this, this bike has no water bottle mounting points on the frame. This particular example of the bike is a size medium, which for me, being five foot seven or 170 centimeters, is absolutely the perfect fit. Couldn't be better. Here's the sizing recommendations from Detroit Bikes, if you wanna take a look at that. If I measure this frame itself, it looks like it's just a hair over 19 inches. The headset is a Nico 1 and 1 8 threadless headset. Moving on to the stem itself, we have a 90 millimeter Safort aluminum stem with a 10 degree rise. And by the way, that stem will be slightly longer for the large and extra large bikes. The handlebars are black painted aluminum, 630 millimeters wide with an eight degree sweep and a 15 millimeter rise. Moving on to the grips, these are called Velo grips. They're black craton rubber with uh, raised pads. I do like the non e Sparrow grips slightly better. They're very similar, but I find that these are a little bit harder and were a little less comfortable after a while. Moving on to the brake levers, you guessed it, all black. That's a theme here. Apparently these are unbranded, but they are all aluminum and e-bike e specific in that they do have a sensor which will cut power to the motor when the brakes, either one of the brakes are applied. From the brake levers onto the brake calipers, these are MD300 Tektro mechanical disc brakes, one piece caliper, which fit 160 millimeter rotor. The wheels themselves are actually different than the non e Sparrow bike in that they have more spokes. So this is a 36 hole uh, double wall aluminum rim, of course 700C with a 30 millimeter deep section. And again, all black. And because this bike does have the disc brakes and doesn't use the rim brakes, we have a fully painted surface which would otherwise be the, the braking surface. Spokes are 13 gauge stainless steel with nickel plated brass nipples. The front hub is totally blacked out painted. You can't see anything, but according to the Detroit Bikes specification document, they're a Modus 36 hole sealed bearing with a quick release. That's for the front. Now the back of course is a special case because it's a full motor, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Tires are the same as the non e-bike version of their Sparrow, which is the WTB Thick Slicks, which I really like these tires. I feel they grip good. They're 28 millimeters wide, so to me about the perfect width for most kind of urban and, and street riding. And I just love the font. I love the bold Thick Slicks. One of my favorite features in terms of looks on the bike. So one nice thing is last year I reviewed the non e version of the Sparrow and it came with some plastic Welgo pedals. I think they've now upgraded them, at least on the e version, to some, some aluminum pedals, which just look a little bit nicer. Functionally about the same, but they look nicer. Uh, I don't see any kind of branding anywhere. And you may notice that I don't have the reflector. That's because I chose to uh, be a little bit risky and take them off just for looks. I can't say I recommended that though. Moving on to the crank set, according to the Detroit bike specifications, the small and medium should have 165 millimeter cranks and the large and extra large should have 170. However, according to what I'm reading here on the back of my crank, these are actually 170s as well. So I'm not sure why that is, but they are pro wheel branded and they are taper bottom bracket compatible. And I don't believe, I might be wrong, but I don't believe these are specifically for an e-bike, I, I suppose. From what I'm seeing, you could use another crank set if you wanted, or these could be used on another bike. Seat post, cold forged aluminum, 27.2 millimeters, 300 millimeters long for the small and medium, and you guessed it, black. The saddle is actually different from the non e-bike version of the Sparrow that I tested last year. This is now a DDK. According to their documentations, it's called a Super Soft. Personally, I preferred the saddle from the non e-bike that I tested last year. 
but this one was plenty comfortable as well. Okay, let's finally get on to the juicy part, the motor, the battery, the controller. This bike has a ba Bafang, I don't know how to say it, Bafang RMG010.250.D motor. Okay, that's a internally geared 250 watt motor. And it turns out it's a very popular 250 watt motor that generally seems to be considered good quality. The gearing ratio is a one to 4.42 ratio. And that just means it has more low end grunt than some of the non geared motors, which will typically be bigger and more powerful. So it lets you get away with a smaller motor and you still get quite a bit of a torque. And just a quick overview in case you don't know about e-bikes, they tend to go from 250 to 1000 watts in terms of the motor power. So how do you control the motor? That's with the controller. Now the controller on this bike is actually integrated into the battery tray, which I think is especially nice because unlike some of the e-bikes, especially the kits and stuff, you don't have some kind of big old ugly controller just floating around on the frame somewhere. It's actually integrated right into the tray. Now I was having a little bit of trouble figuring out what controller that actually was, but I did find after removing the tray from the frame, I found a tag or a sticker underneath which did have the controller product number on it and their website. But upon going to the website, I really couldn't find that exact controller. So I don't think with this type of controller, you'll really be able to make any modifications. I'm sure if you're some kind of real electrician or something like that, or, you know, expert in small electronics, you could figure it out. But for me, I didn't know what to do. Like if I wanted to unlock the top speed, remember this is a hacking channel. <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't know how to unlock the top speed on this bike with that controller. What I would do and what probably would work if I wanted to do that is actually bypass that controller, mount one of those ugly controllers up here somewhere and just plug the motor into that controller, plug the battery into that controller, plug everything into that controller, which you would have all control over. Then obviously you could unlock the top speed and, and et cetera, et cetera, do those type of things. Okay, moving on to the battery itself. I also couldn't find the exact source of this battery, but according to the Detroit Bikes website, it's a 36 volt 7.8 amp hour battery using Samsung cells. Almost for sure these are the 18650 cells that you read about and hear about everywhere regarding e-bikes. And from what I have read and what I can tell, these are totally legit cells and presumably a totally legit battery pack. However, 7.8 amp hours is on the low end. And by the way, I'm not an e-bike expert, certainly not around electronics and stuff, but, but basically the voltage being this is a 36 volt motor, 36 volt controller, 36 volt battery pack is kind of going to say how much power you can put into this motor, how much power it is. Like the amp hour is more the capacity of the battery. So this is 7.8 amp hour. That's from what I can see a little bit on the low side and that's why that correlates, let's say, with the distance that this bike can go, which is rated at 25 miles or 40 kilometers. Um, by the way, on that, I did ride about 39 something kilometers before I came back home and I still had more battery left. So I think that it's, it's um, rating is either spot on or maybe even a little bit conservative. I suppose I probably could have gone maybe 45 kilometers it all totally depends on how much additional wattage you're putting into the pedals as to how much the motor has to work, therefore how much the battery is going to use. So I suppose they had to pick some number um, and it's going to vary really depending on how much, how hard you pedal during the, the usage of the bike. So um, de definitely I think their, their 40 kilometer range is, is probably right in line, if not a bit conservative. Now from what I've also seen online with this battery pack, more than likely, as long as you get a 36 uh, volt battery pack, I mean, do your homework, but you can probably put that on here if it has a higher amp hour rating, like maybe a 14, and you could probably nearly double your range if you were to buy one of these 14 amp hour 36 volt batteries. Maybe you reach out to Detroit Bikes before you make those modifications, but um, or, or an expert at least, but I'm betting that would work if you did need to increase the range beyond 25 miles or 40 kilometers. In addition with this uh, bike and this battery pack, it does come with a charger, which can charge the battery while it's mounted to the bike, which is the way I always do it, or almost always, or you can take the battery off and charge it wherever you want. So if you have the battery charger in your office and you park your bike at your bike parking lot, 
you could take the battery off, bring the battery into the office and charge it while you're working. Um, everything works perfectly fine with that. The only thing I kind of don't like is it does say in the, the manual for the battery that you should unplug the charger when not in use. So that's a bit tedious to me. That means you're going to have to make sure your battery's on, plug the charger in, plug the plug the charger into the battery, plug the charger into the wall, then reverse all those steps when you're done, which seems a bit tedious. So it, but it is what it is for me. I don't remember what it said in the manual, but I think it was like six hour charge time or something like that. Five. I don't, I don't remember. I almost even think I saw different estimates in different places, but for me, typically three hours, I, I come home cause I usually don't deplete the battery completely. Typically around three, maybe four, maybe two hours. It's hard to say. It's basically totally charged. It's not a problem. I, I ride it home. I put it on the charger. Next time I'm ready, it's ready. That's how I've been using it. Going back to the controls up here, you can actually activate this motor in one of two ways. You can either use the pedal assistance, so it means when you pedal, the motor will kick on and assist you. That's the way I use it pretty much exclusively. Or you can use the thumb throttle. I, I myself like using the pedal assistance much better for a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons though is I think it saves on the motor stress. I think it saves on the battery usage. And uh, I just think it's a little bit more natural just to pedal the bike and it goes rather than having to, you know, push your thumb continuously. Uh, in addition, the thumb throttle to me, I think they should actually remove this feature because honestly, when you use it, I think you'll be a little bit underwhelmed by the performance of the motor when you don't use your legs to assist it. So I, I, I always told my friends who are riding it, don't use that because you're just going to be disappointed. It's not going to feel that fast. Really the magic comes when you're pedaling and then give yourself a boost with that, with that motor, um, via the pedal system. When you have that boost, that feels great. That feels like you're really moving quick. Just the thumb alone. If you're not pedaling, not that exciting. So to simplify things and maybe even cut a few pennies out of the cost, I would say just let's, let's just get rid of the, the thumb throttle. Okay, maybe there is one fun thing to do with this throttle. <laughs> I will say though, one thing um, that you may find slightly annoying with the power assist is there is about a two second delay. So you start pedaling and about two seconds later, the motor will kick in. And if you have it on a high setting, which by the way, you can do up here, there's three settings, it'll be a pretty nice boost. And by the way, on the controller, you do have three power settings, low, medium, and high. Personally, I think they could just get rid of low because I find it about useless. Uh, medium, I like to use in, in tighter spaces, like on sidewalks. And then high is what I use about 95% of the time when I'm just out on the road riding around. Um, also, you have a battery power indicator on one, two, or three green lights. Okay, and you may be curious about the weight of this bike. I actually am too. I think it's... It feels, okay, it's heavy, but for an e-bike, I'm betting this is not that bad. I'm looking at about 16.7 kilograms. So, I mean, that's heavy for a traditional bike, but um, for an e-bike, I think that's pretty reasonable. And I will tell you, you can ride this bike almost like a totally normal bike if the battery's off or if you're out of power or whatever. Um, and it rides really fine. Um, I think you could... You could ride this like a normal bike, especially if you take the battery off and lose even more of that weight. So that's a nice thing. If you do run out of batteries while you're riding, you can keep riding and it'll be a fine riding experience because the bike isn't tremendously heavy. Now I've only rode the bike about 200 kilometers over the past month. So I can't really say a whole lot about the reliability and ruggedness of it, but I will say a lot of those 200 kilometers were pretty rough riding on sidewalks, through sand, over some gravel sometimes. Um, just banging around town, sometimes off curbs even, and I never had any problems, no reliability issues whatsoever, no problems. It's just, it's been perfect. And so I can't really say anything to that. And it's only 200 kilometers. Now I have had in this time, what, four different people ride the bike and it's really gave nobody no issues. So I can't say any, too much about the reliability other than it's been perfect in the 200 kilometers and uh, one month that I've been riding. So speaking of riding, how is the riding? Well, it's neutral and the position is very comfortable and relaxed. 
you're sitting up pretty upright on this type of bike. Electric assistance to me is excellent. Now it's only the 250 watt motor, which is on the lower end of motors, but honestly to me, it feels great. The power is great. I, I mean, yes, you could have more power always, but it feels totally sufficient to me. Puts a smile on my face when I ride. I really enjoy that aspect of the bike. However, I will say on the top speed, it is electronically governed. Actually, the top speed isn't electronically governed. The assistance uh, is governed up to only 17 miles an hour or 28 kilometers an hour, which seems a little bit low. Um, if you look at other class two in the US and the United States bikes, it does say that the limit is allowed to be up to 20 miles an hour. So it's three miles an hour less They've limited this to assist you three miles an hour less than that maximum. So I feel like it could be a little bit faster. It would be nice if it was a little bit faster, but honestly, for 99% of the people, 28 kilometers an hour or 17 miles an hour is plenty. It's, it's quick. It's quick enough um, to get to point A to point B. I will say, though, for me, though, sometimes when I'm out, especially on more of the open roads, um, I, I, could, I could like to go a little bit faster. That... that three miles an hour would be nice to have. But I did a little bit more thinking about it as to why they might have limited it three miles an hour less than it had to be. And riding it, it started becoming apparent to me the reason why they might have done that. And that has to do with the gearing. So what I find is when I am at that 28 kilometers an hour, 17 mile an hour maximum, my feet are moving pretty fast. So if I wanted to go another three miles an hour faster, my feet are gonna be spinning really, really fast. And the problem there is that once your feet are spinning at a certain, your legs are turning and your feet are turning at a certain RPM, uh, you're going to have trouble applying power after a certain RPM. And it could be the engineers realized that after 28 kilometers an hour, 17 miles an hour, that most people aren't applying very much power anymore. And the problem is if you're not applying any more power at that speed or, or your power that you're helping is decreasing, that means the motor is gonna to have to start picking up the slack to keep that speed. In addition, you have now more wind, uh, more air to be pushing out of the way, so you're also requiring more power. So it could be that the engineers realize that to give you that extra three miles an hour, it's gonna put a huge extra load on the motor to, to, to try to help do that, and therefore the battery, and therefore significantly decrease your range. And they may have made the decision that it's not worth it to significantly decrease the range just to gain three kilometers or excuse me three miles an hour extra on your top speed especially when most people won't even notice it so you may be thinking though as i thought well why don't they just gear it up a little bit so yes you could gear it up you could put a smaller uh cog in the back here and then then your feet wouldn't be spinning so fast at that given speed and that would essentially for the most part solve the problem however this bike also has maybe a little bit of another issue. And I didn't mention it before, but starting off is a little bit sluggish. Remember I said there was about two seconds delay. So that first two seconds before the electronic motor kicks in, it's a bit of a heavy bike and it is a little bit of a sluggish one to start off the line. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's not the quickest off the line. So if they geared it even higher to solve the top end problem and you have that two second delay before the motor kicks in, now you're going to really be push, having to push pretty hard off the line. So I think their, their thought probably was we don't want to compromise any more uh, acceleration just to get a few extra miles an hour on the top end. So that's my thinking why maybe it's, going to, uh, it's not reaching the top end that is even allowed for the class 2 e-bike that it is. So stepping back a little bit. It doesn't even really matter that much. It's quick enough as it is. I probably wouldn't want to sacrifice any of the acceleration or battery power uh, just to get a few extra miles an hour. That said, it would kind of be nice to go a little faster. All right, so stepping away from the technical stuff for a little bit, let's just talk about the looks and the style. Um, to me, the looks and the style on this bike are excellent. There's basically 10 out of 10. I can't imagine the, an e-bike or any bike looking better than this. I love the black on black on black on black everywhere. As you can see, black on black. Um, that's my style too. I love it, love the style. I even love the, the thick slick, the font, everything looks awesome. 
They went with a gold and black theme here, just a few gold accents. It says Electronic Sparrow, gold even up here, yellowish gold, a uh, little gold here. I think the looks are 10 out of 10. I like how they hid the wires, and I didn't mention it before, but they also hid some of the cabling in the top tube. Right, comes out here again, so this is for the rear disc. So I think with styling and looks, super good. And it looks really cool because the where the uh, brakes would be for the for the caliper brakes is painted over, so it's really, really black. I think it looks awesome. The only thing it could maybe, maybe slightly look better that some bikes, some e-bikes do have is the more integrated battery packs. But typically that's gonna cost a lot more money because then they're gonna have to have a more customized frame, gonna have to use more custom batteries, blah, 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 blah. It looks pretty good and actually, uh, before I started doing this video, I had a frame bag sitting right here, and I think that looked really good actually to kind of fill out the uh, frame triangle. So looks wise to me, two, maybe even three thumbs up. Super nice. I like the looks. So is it a good e-bike? I have a little bit of experience with e-bikes. I've rode several of them before this. I've never owned one, but I've rode several of them. One of them I even rode for a couple weeks. It was a friend of mine's. It was a Cube e-bike, Cube e-mountain bike really liked that bike it was really nice um, but is this a good e-bike with that experience i would say it's not only a good e-bike but a great e-bike i actually really like this bike i don't plan on ever giving it away um, it is on a budget you know it's 899 dollars which isn't the cheapest but it's not the most it's far far from the most expensive it's it's on the lower end and there are some compromises they had to make uh, considering that price such as the battery capacity um, such as not having hydraulic discs, for example, not having gears maybe. Um, so there are some compromises, but at the end of the day, it's a great riding bike. If I want to go to the store, I just jump on this bike. I can get there faster with less um, sweat on my body here in Florida. That's a big thing. And it just works great. I plan on putting the frame bag back on. I'm probably going to put the basket on the front and this will be like my my main bike when I run, run to the store, or do, you know, trips around town just to get to point A to point B. To me, it really helps replace the car. Um, I have a car, we have a car, um, but generally when I have the chance, I try to take my bike. And this bike helps me even want to say yes to do that even more. I won't say it's, a, it's, it's not the cheapest. There are cheaper e-bikes you can get, but I will say the value, what you get style-wise, um, you know, functionality wise, simplicity, I think that's actually a, an attribute, a positive attribute. Um, I don't think you can get much better. So, I mean, should you get the bike? Well, obviously that's up to you. I hope this review video um, informed you on what it is. Maybe compare it, you can compare it to other e-bikes, but in my opinion, it's, it's a great bike. I, I really like it. That's 100% genuine. They did send me this bike to keep, uh, but I, I personally really like it. I'll put a link to their website down below so you can get to this bike real easy and look at any more details you want or photos or whatever. I think that'll about do it for this video. I think we've said enough about the bike. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks Detroit Bikes for sending me the bike. If you're watching this, please give me a like. Please comment if you have any, any thoughts, any questions. Do you like it? Do you not like it? What do you think in relation to other bikes? Just leave the comments below. Uh, I look at every single comment and I reply to almost every single one of them. So thanks again for watching. Uh, have a great day. See you guys. Bye.